Good morning, everyone. Welcome. So my name is Scott Sellers. I'm the organizer for the Big Data and Earth Sciences Grand Challenges Workshop. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, really excited to, to see so many faces, faces today and uh, looking forward to the next two and a half days. Uh, some great sessions that are going to deal with uh, everything from uh, software and hardware engineering uh, to data transfer and networking to uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, applications in, in earth sciences. Uh, first off, let me just say that uh, we're very thankful uh, from the support of our sponsors, uh, the Pacific Research Platform, an NSF-funded project here at CalIT2, um, led by Dr. Larry Smarr and his team, uh, the Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes, Dr. Marty Ralph. Um, we're very thankful for uh, his support as well. Um, in addition, uh, Scripps Institution of Oceanography's director, Dr. Mar Margaret Leinen, for uh, the support uh, as well. And so uh, we'd like to thank uh, all three who have allowed this uh, workshop to, to, to actually happen. Um, we'd also like to thank Dr. Thomas DeFonte for encouraging uh, this workshop to take place here at CalIT2. Uh, our planning committee, uh, Dr. Anna Wilson, Dr. Julie Kolansky, and Minghua Zhang, and other volunteers who uh, have worked hard to, to put together the different sessions and make sure that this uh, workshop will run smoothly. Uh, please let us know if you have any uh, questions or concerns throughout the two and a half days. We'll be happy to assist you in any way possible. Uh, Sarah Turner and Donna uh, Schabke, uh, both uh, event planners uh, who have also put in a lot of time and effort in ensuring that uh, all of our food and, and the, you know, the location is ready to go. So just thank you all uh, for uh, that support. Uh, it's been uh, tremendous working with you all. So, so this is the Big Data um, and the Earth Sciences Grand Challenges Workshop. Uh, the motivation for this workshop is uh, really to, to get us all into a room uh, together uh, from a diverse set of fields to discuss these emerging technologies in uh, computer science, uh, computer engineering. Um, these big data approaches are coming online very quickly and being able to process and analyze data is really the goal uh, of um, you know, this workshop and, and, and looking at methods to do so. Uh, we also want to focus on the challenges and opportunities as these technologies and methods come online. Uh, Earth sciences uh, have very unique types of data and they can be very challenging to um, to, to work on and work with. And so um, throughout the next two and a half days, uh, I've asked the speakers to try to, um, you know, provide some insight into the challenges they have with using their expertise to understand your sciences. The outcomes of this workshop uh, really are, 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 are two main priorities. Um, the first is to build new networks uh, and to, to start new collaborations. Uh, in this room, we have earth scientists, computer scientists, engineers, hardware engineers, all folks who deal with big data at, at some level. And so hopefully throughout the next two and a half days, you can have lots of great conversations uh, with uh, a diverse set of people to really try to help figure out how best we can move forward in uh, big data in the earth sciences. And towards the end, we're going to uh, have a wrap up panel and try to see if there's some overlapping priorities that can be laid out. And we'd like to, to, to write up a, a workshop report that really tries to highlight all of these areas that we think uh, moving forward would help us uh, in the earth sciences. We have four grand challenge lectures. So these are uh, four uh, terrific speakers um, that range from uh, network technology to computer science to earth sciences. Um, Dr. Larry Smarr, who will be uh, leading us off here in a moment, um, is the founding director of CalIT2. He's one of our lecturers. Um, Dr. Uh, Michael Werner, who will be here uh, later this afternoon. He's a, a well-known climate scientist and climate modeler at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Uh, has um, hundreds of terabytes and petabytes of data that they are uh, looking for ways to, to analyze uh, better and, and use new technologies. And then Dr. Vipin Kumar and Dr. Park Smith, two uh, prominent computer scientists who, uh, in a unique way, have engaged the earth sciences community uh, by applying computational methodologies to the earth sciences. And so we're looking forward to all four of those uh, presentations. We also have a great list of speakers throughout all of the different sessions. 
uh, that hopefully will complement those, those grand challenges talks uh, in, in their own ways. A couple logistics, uh, the bathrooms are out this door to the right down the hallway, uh, and so it's always good to know where those are. Uh, at lunch time today, we're going to have an open house, uh, which uh, will um, be for the big wall, which is right next door to this room in the Cal IT2 theater. And so we encourage you to, to have uh, some lunch and then uh, take a tour of, uh, of that facility. It's a really a technological marvel with the different types of hardware they have in there to help visualize uh, data. Uh, and then tomorrow um, evening, uh, we'll have a reception at the Martin Johnson House, which is a, uh, a historic place on Scripps Institution of Oceanography's campus just down the hill. It's right along the coast. It has beautiful views. And hopefully, we can take our conversations from uh, the workshop down there in a very relaxed environment to, to continue those conversations. Um, for that reception, the buses will leave at 5 p.m. Uh, from uh, in front of Atkinson Hall. We'll have uh, folks here to help uh, guide you all to the, to the buses so that we can all get down there. Uh, those buses will um, take us back to Cal IT2, uh, and hopefully, uh, I believe they'll drop off uh, at the three hotels that were listed on the PRP website. So uh, you'll be provided that transportation uh, from the, the reception. So with that, I, I think we'll uh, go ahead and, and kick off this, this workshop. Um, so our very first speaker and our first Grand Challenge uh, lecture is from Dr. Larry Smarr. Uh, he's the founding director of the California Institute uh, for Telecommunications and Information Technology, otherwise known as CalIT2. Uh, this is a uh, UCSD and UC Irvine partnership. Uh, Dr. Smarr holds the Harry E. Gruber Professorship uh, in Computer Science and Engineering at UC San Diego's Jacobs School of Engineering. Um, before he founded CalIT2 here at UCSD, he was a professor of physics and astronomy uh, and the founding director of the National Center for Supercomputing Applications at the University of Illinois. Uh, he's a member of the National Academy of Engineering as well as a fellow of the American Physical Society and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Uh, in 2006, he received the IEEE Computer Science to Sutomo Kanai Award for his lifetime achievements in distributed computing uh, systems, and in 2014, the Golden Goose Award. Uh, he served on uh, the NASA Advisory Council for four NASA administrators, was a chair of NASA's Information Technology Infrastructure Committee, and NSF Advisory Committee on Cyber Infrastructure, uh, not just in the uh, physical sciences, but he also for eight years uh, was a member of the NIH Advisory Committee um, to uh, three serving uh, NIH directors. So uh, with that, uh, I'm going to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Smart to the podium. Let's give him a warm round of applause. Well, thanks a lot, Scott. I want to thank you personally. Um, it's uh, rare that I see someone in the early stages of their career put together such a sophisticated uh, session as this, and I appreciate everybody uh, working with Scott on that. I'm going to take you through um, the Pacific Research Platform, uh, an NSF uh, grant that I'm the principal investigator for that is setting up a general cyber infrastructure for big data in science and engineering. Um, we're going to focus in on the earth sciences, but this is, as you'll see, um, able to support everything from cancer genomics to particle physics to astronomy to actually um, digital archaeology. So um, this idea of building a cyber infrastructure for us, for people that have a thousand to a million times as big a data object as, you know, the one and a half billion folks who update their Facebook page every day with their smartphone. Um, we can't do our work over the conventional commodity internet uh, by moving these objects around. So there was a whole series of grants from the NSF going back now 15 years uh, that led us to uh, this view 
this is a 2009 slide I had to show you where we were eight years ago, uh, with the idea that you could link together on a national scale using optical fibers uh, at 10,000 megabits a second, 10 gigabits a second. Um, everything from visualization to clusters to uh, scientific instruments, uh, telepresence, uh, uh, to uh, all of the NSF supercomputer resources. That, I think, was a stimulus to the Department of Energy coming up with a formalization. That is, this is one of the most important. I mean, I know it's a wordy slide, right? I apologize for that. But this is a historically important thing when the DOE actually abstracted out what was needed as, they could have used a better term, DMZ, um, that changed everything. And I mean changed everything on a 30-year time frame. Uh, because what they said was, for us, we need a separate network based on the internet technology on our campuses that will allow big data to move around as easily as the normal commodity data. And that there was an architecture here where you had what are called DTNs, data transfer nodes, that are the endpoints of this optical network. I mean, if you think about it, if I come into your lab and I say, hey, you won the lottery, here's your 10 gigabit per second uh, optical fiber, uh, you're going to now get a thousand times as much data every second in your lab as you have been getting, uh, just plug it in what, right? You've got CAT6, you know, blue cable <laughs> plug-ins on the back of your PCs, but what do you do with this optical thing? So uh, there was a whole conceptualization of what's the right termination device. This, this is highly engineered to terminate bandwidth that will be deliverable by the cellular internet or Wi-Fi and nothing more, because otherwise why would you spend the money from a vendor point of view? And that's the same thing with your PC and the, and the wired internet and, and, and so on. Um, so that was an important point, and we'll come back to that quite a bit. Then the ability to measure um, on a regular basis the throughput, because these networks are going over multiple administrative uh, domains and therefore have to be, um, there, there can be, <laughs> There are lurking tiger traps to grub up your bits and prevent you from getting good bandwidth everywhere. And one of the things I'm most proud of for this project is we have got the best network engineers on the West Coast working together in a volunteer way to make this Pacific Research Platform happen um, in a way they've never worked together before. And without that, it couldn't happen. It's a, it's a really an amazing achievement that they, they've, had, they've been able to put together. Well, this plus a uh, long series of uh, reports coming from the community to the NSF, including one called the Campus Bridging Task Force that I was part of, um, that together uh, convinced the NSF that this was a sea change. And so over the last um, five years, the NSF has funded on-campus data freeways. Think of it like the freeways in, you know, in L.A. or in San Diego or, or in Chicago on the campus. Now, I've been at this game 30 or 40 years, and I can tell you that the NSF never invested on campus in networks like this before. This is it in 30 or 40 years. So it is a fundamental step function change in our capabilities as scientists and engineers to do big data. However, each of these is done individually by the campus based on their local history of how they've done networking. And so although they all are DMZs, that doesn't mean that they're necessarily the same technically. And so putting them together is really quite difficult. So the way that we solve this problem was to go back to the fundamental aspect of the DMZ I talked about, which is your data transfer node. And this is one of our top research engineers here, John Graham. And John, you have such, 
such timing. <laughs> so uh, without John, I don't think the PRP would happen. Um, he's really unique in that capability. Um, and, and so what he's done is put together these uh, basically rack-mounted or desk-side PCs, but optimized for big data. Now, what does that mean? Well, they look just like a normal PC in that they have CPUs and RAM and, and, and um, all that, but what they've got is 1040 or 240 gigabit uh, per second network interface cards that take optical in and out, and then they have flash. So flash memory, this is the revolution that's going on in solid-state memory, um, in the computer industry, this is 10 times faster than disk, and in fact the newest on volatile memory is, is up to 100 times faster. Uh, that's critical to be able to handle this vast uh, data rate coming in. Without this bucket, basically, you really can't do much uh, if, would you, if you have the optical coming in. So we then wanted to make sure this was as as built on commodity and therefore as cheap as possible. So, so these are like, you can buy them under your supply budget on your grant. And if you just need a gigabit, we can get it down to say $1,000. So these have been built, and you see John there, he, well he builds these things and then we drop ship them. And we've done something like 30 or 40 of these things now across the, the Pacific Research Platform. Now what that lets you do on a campus is just to give you one example, this is in, uh, work I've been doing with Rob Knight in the microbiome, uh, which is you're talking about trillions of bases of DNA that uh, are, are uh, sequenced by Illumina sequencers. Um, and then this has to flow to the supercomputer. We've, for instance, run on this, um, well, in the last year, I guess, uh, a million core hours, which is, um, you know, a CPU century is 800,000 hours. So, a lot of time. And so that produces vast amounts of data. And how to just, just on the campus, how do you get that around? And so, uh, we got one of those NSF grants that I showed you the dots on the, on the, on the national map. Uh, Phil Papadopoulos is the, is, the, is the PI. And this allows you to just run all this big data around. Now, if you were down in particle physics, if you were an SIO, all these places have their own versions of this because they're all just running over wavelengths that are on the existing uh, optical fiber. We've never laid any fiber, right? There's plenty of fiber. Each fiber, you know, is capable of doing up to say 100 10 gigabit channels. And if you take our campus, um, there's 30,000 end users of the internet and, and their entire traffic, all of it, goes over one 10 gigabit. So when I give that to you, you have the same bandwidth as 30,000 people are using on the campus, and that's what makes it such a big de deal. Well, so the next logical step would be, can we link together multiple campuses, because after all, that's how big science, uh, big data science is done, is in collaboration. And so um, we pulled together over uh, 20 um, campuses, um, and we got, we decided that what we would do is you know, we wanted to have multi-campus scientific collaborations that were already going on that were going on without the benefit of this kind of bandwidth. And uh, we went out to those and said, would you be willing to be the early adopters and try out this? And so we had over 50 people like you uh, who have signed letters of commitment uh, to work on this. And, and the CIOs, uh, the chief information officers, or, or the network equivalents on their campuses from over 32 campuses. Um, now, the thing that I find fascinating about this project, none of those people get a dime out of this grant. In fact, this whole grant, organizing the entire West Coast and all the research universities, public and private, on the, on the West Coast, is three FTEs. That's all the grant pays for. And John is a good fraction of that, uh, one of those FTEs. So um, it's a volunteer effort to see if we can raise up a whole new way of doing big science. And, it, and that's what I find fascinating about it. Well, how's it going? Well, when we started, uh, 
This is a, 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 a thing that John does uh, four times a day, is he sends out, what, 10 gigabyte file from one um, Fiona to another, from one campus to another, and then measures using grid FTP what the throughput is. And so, in other words, from it's an N by N matrix, <laughs> and so we want to know all possible paths. And if it's uh, yellow, that means it's less than five gigabits a second, which is not what we want, uh, but it's better than ping, right? So ping works. <laughs> and then the first thing you find is, because you're going, think about what you're doing. You're going from the third floor of the physics department well, in the physics department, the physics department handles the networking. Then you're going across, say, the UCSD campus, and on that campus, the CIO handles the networking. Then you go on to Scenic, the California Research and Education Network, and they handle the networking the way they do it between the campuses. Then you go on to, say, Santa Barbara, and now you're back to a different CIO has a different history of how they do things on their campus, and then you go up to the second floor of the physics department and they're back into a different department. Okay, that's the way the world works. And it was no one's job, and to this day, it's no one's job to get you disk to disk to your collaborator at say 9.6 gigabits a second out of 10. For these folks, I accepted the role of being, it's my job and to put together the team that can deliver this. But in the real world today, we live in this crazy quilt networking world. Even though the internet connects everything, once you get into the actual trying to get it to work efficiently, you find out that there's software problems, there's bent pins and routers that nobody knew about, there's all this stuff, and that's what these things figure out. Well. The network engineers, of which there are dozens, that have a phone call for an hour every week and have now for a year and a half, I guess, or a year and three quarters, something like that, need longer, um, they were able to uh, buy, this is just as of last um, month, about a month ago, you see the green, those are all greater than five gigabits a second. Um, and you see that instead of uh, just a few, we have now 24 uh, Fionas. And John, that's probably not the latest. I don't know. What's the, what's the latest number? Which one? We have some that aren't on the net that we were uh, doing a lot of experiments mm -hmm. for, uh, for more than that. Yeah, so and, and like I said, it's, we're looking some of these up to 100 gigabits a second. So the underlying network, this is the achievement of the last year and a half, basically, is to set up that um, network. But then as it was coming up, we went back to the multi-campus teams that we selected for this proposal uh, from these areas and uh, started getting them up and going. And I just want to show you a few of those, and then I'm going to delve into four big examples of the earth sciences that have been using this. So. Um, this is closely related to the Earth Sciences. It's the Pacific Earthquake Engineering Research Center that's, that's headquartered in Berkeley. However, as you can see, there are many labs, including both uh, people doing analysis, uh, shake tables, uh, and so forth. They're sending massive amounts of data back and forth. And uh, here's John. Um, uh, John doesn't just doesn't sit here in the lab. Uh, he's, this is him up at, at Berkeley installing uh, the Fionet. Uh, uh, and on the Berkeley campus that can do the gigabit per second uh, back and forth. So we've got them starting to come up. Um, one of the things that NSF has done, and I don't know how many of you have this on your campus, but a number of campuses have put in for and been funded for cyber infrastructure engineers. And here is one uh, good buddy of ours up at uh, uh, Santa Cruz. and. Um, uh, that's uh, him uh, 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 receiving the um, Fiona and putting it in. Why did they do that? Well, many of, we're going to hear a lot during this uh, session, uh, that during this couple of days, on uh, using supercomputers. NCAR is going to come up a lot, climate modeling and so forth. I'm looking forward to those talks. And um, the, what we found is the following. This is the, one of them. The, this is the dark energy spectroscopic instrument. 
this is taking 250 images a night, over 800 gigabytes, almost a terabyte a night. And then it goes to um, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab to the NERST supercomputer, uh, energy supercomputer, and uh, they have a workflow that turns that into the actual data in the sky. But it turns out then, if you're, say there's a lot of astronomers and astrophysicists at Santa Cruz, it turns out. Um, I used to do it for 25 years, so I you know, know the secret handshake. Uh, they don't want all the data, they want some subset of the data that they want to work on. So you, the logical thing is, well, gee, it's sitting at a supercomputer center. Why don't you just supercompute on it there and then send the results back to Santa Cruz? Trouble is, they went to the supercomputer center and they said, nope, we've used up all the time on just analyzing the data. We don't have any more time for you. We got a lot of this science we got to cover. Now, the irony of this is there's a thousand node cluster sitting at Santa Cruz dedicated just to astronomy and astrophysics. But how do you get the, the data set down, right? And so now that we've got, uh, from just the commodity internet in this last year and a half, it's up to 100 gigabit a second now, between the supercomputer center uh, at NERSC in Berkeley and the, to the cluster in Santa Cruz. So now they can routinely download and do a lot of local analysis. And I think when we talk about climate science, I'm gonna give you an example of that, where that's exactly the same mode. And then visualizing this, uh, as you know, we do a lot of virtual reality here, and Tom DeFani over here, my co-PI on the PRP, these are his um, designs with Greg Daw, uh, who's uh, sitting on the second from the left on, on the uh, right-hand picture. Um, and uh, Merced wanted to get one of these uh, seamless uh, um, uh, virtual reality facilities, but more the point, for 20 some odd years, 25 years, we demonstrated starting back at NCSA that you can have a three-dimensional data set that is shared over the optical network between the two sites and the investigators at both sites can go into the same database and you can actually create avatars of where the other people are in that data set and you can have the avatar talking to you and all kinds of cool things like that. So you can jointly uh, you know, interact with and analyze these data sets. But to do that, you've gotta be able to have uh, pretty instantaneous communication back and forth for high bandwidth. And, and so we designed this uh, cave for Merced and then I helped them build it and now we're able to, two, gigabyte, two gigabytes takes about two seconds uh, between the two. So you can actually now imagine um, beginning to do this joint uh, um, analysis in virtual reality. Now one of the, the, the problems with all this is that um, how do you get people trained up to do this? <laughs> how do you get the scientists and engineers to know enough about the networking and software and everything and how do you get the networking people on the campus to appreciate and support the needs of the scientists? Because on most campuses, including this one, until a year ago, we did not have in the uh, CIO's office a person dedicated to supporting research, researchers with IT. Okay, now we do. But it's that way on a lot of campuses. So what we've done is we've taken this on the road and we've had a number of uh, uh, workshops uh, at different campuses to bring together on that campus the researchers, uh, the application researchers, and the networking and, and so forth experts, um, and then uh, help them understand how on their campus they can do this. So uh, I'm just gonna take you through four examples um, of the earth sciences where we have got uh, people beginning to work with this, uh, and I think these are illustrative of different types of earth sciences uh, efforts. It's uh, certainly not comprehensive, but it's, it's encouraging. Uh, the first one is uh, actually um, made possible by Scott Sellers, our, our host for this uh, three-day workshop, and that's because he uh, has been uh, working as a postdoc here with uh, Marty Ralph in the Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes, 
uh, which, you know, this is the map sort of how the atmospheric water works in the West. Uh, you know, you saw this winter, the atmospheric rivers reasserting themselves, causing massive flooding and you know, record snowfalls and things like that. That's actually very normal. Uh, that's what at atmospheric rivers do to the West Coast. Uh, and then Arizona, what you think of as a desert, is actually in a monsoon <laughs> uh, region. It's just different parts of the year that that happens. Um, and uh, the, the nice thing is that Scott previously was up at Irvine, where some of you I'm sure know uh, Sarusian, uh, who I worked with for many years at NASA uh, when I was advising NASA. And he, as you know, uh, has the Center for Hydrometeorology and Remote Sensing, and his, uh, uh, his center uh, tracks all of the atmospheric moisture and precipitation events worldwide on a, on a real-time basis, and then gets that out uh, to everybody. And uh, that's where Scott was before he came to SIO and working with Marty. So we're fortunate in Scott to have somebody who's got very deep uh, both scientific and technical roots at, at two of the campuses on the PRP, uh, Irvine and, and San Diego. And so what he's done, and this will lead to another thing that I want to end up talking about, is the importance of machine learning and how that's really coming to the earth sciences as well as to Google and Amazon and Facebook and Microsoft and so forth. Um, and, and this is a very clever idea. It's, if, you, if you think of a storm developing, I'm used to the Midwest. May, you may remember that Bob Wilhelmson and, and Kevin Drogemeyer did these supercomputer simulations of thunderstorms and then from them the tornado genesis uh, out of the thunderstorms. And so these things are just big um, sort of self-excited objects in the atmosphere that have a lifetime. They start with a convective updraft and then they form this nonlinear structure, anvil top and all this, and then, but they're traveling along the ground at about like 60 miles an hour and then they you know, get bigger and then they rain out and then eventually they die. Well, that's a space-time object, right? And the cool thing, um, innovative thing that uh, Scott has done is to realize that from this data hypercube of, of lat long and, and time, uh, you can actually uh, abstract out of it a data, uh, a space-time object. So that's the life of that object uh, from birth to death, and um, then put it in a database. And now you have, for the whole globe, a set of data objects. Uh, each one is an atmospheric moisture entity. Uh, what that then allows you to do is use machine learning on this vast amount of, I mean, imagine several years of all the <laughs> moisture events on Earth, right, of, of trying to understand, for, to ask questions. Well, like, where do those moisture objects start? You know, inquiring minds want to know. And machine learning is a tool you need to figure it out. And here's an early map. Um, you know, from Scott um, on, on how you do that. So that process, you know, the stuff is up at Irvine. He's trying to process this. There's a lot of it's at NASA. You've got to pull all this together. And what we've been uh, doing, of course, is, is putting uh, that uh, Sarusha's lab was one of the early ones up at Irvine that we hooked onto the Pacific Research Platform. And of course, down at SIO, we have our own uh, Fiona's. And so the Fiona to Fiona talks uh, over um, this. And then uh, the Comet supercomputer is available for in the mean, uh, in the middle for computing on. Well, the amazing thing is that when he started, this was a 20 day process to do the workflow once. Uh, it's currently uh, brought down to 20 hours. And this year, it will be brought down to 20 minutes. Now, let me just explain this, because this is why I got into supercomputing in the first place. When I, I, was a, I was a physicist doing black hole solving general relativity and doing like magnetohydrodynamic uh, accretion onto, onto rotating black holes um, at Illinois, and, and, I had a, and, and this was before the supercomputer centers, and I ran on a you know, VAX 11780, many of you probably did. Uh, that was the best you could get, pretty much, in the university. I took that code over to Munich, uh, where the Max Planck Institute for Physics and Astrophysics 
uh, in Garching by Munich and, and ran it on the Cray 1 over there. And what I would do is, is you know, make runs during the day on the backs and then I'd do one eight hour run a night. And then, so that would be my scientific rate of progress, you know, what I got in the big run that night. I put it on the Cray, went out, said, let's go have lunch. By the time I got to the door, it went ka -ching. I said, oops, I must have had a JCL error, you know, for those of you who are long, old, old enough to remember that. Um, no, it was done. How could it be done, eight hour run? Well, eight hours times 60 minutes is 480 minutes, and it got done in a minute and a half. So it was 400 times faster, okay? So instead of the amount of science I could do every day from doing an eight hour run at night, I can now do every 10 minutes. And that's what Scott's doing. Except now it's a network. It's a super network, not a supercomputer. But it's the same thing. So it makes a huge difference to scientific productivity. Uh, we're going to have some great talks on climate change, so I'm not going to go into detail on that. But many of you will know Dan Kayan here uh, and his colleagues who uh, are tasked to come up with a 50-year detailed climate change forecast for California and Nevada uh, every couple of years. And to do that, what they have to do is to download the higher and higher and higher every year resolution uh, global climate models uh, to subset out of that uh, a region in the West and, 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 and then download it here to make regional forecasts. Um, so of course, NCAR has been central to the PRP. We've worked with both uh, Mulder and with the Wyoming Supercomputer Center, uh, um, Marla Mayle and, and uh, a number of the others there have worked closely with us and they have brought up the connection from NCAR, in fact, from the Wyoming Supercomputer Center to UCSD and the PRP. Uh, gradually, I guess it's close now to 100 gigabits, but to 10, to 40, and then the uh, goal is 100. And what that allows is this kind of forecast. Here's the average uh, summer afternoon temperature as it was historically um, from the 60s through the 90s, and red is over 100 for the average afternoon. And this is where we, uh, the climate models say, will be um, in not that many years. So these kind of details are completely important for the planning in California of how to adapt to climate change, whether it's agriculture, water, whatever it is, um, and um, uh, it's a good example. Well, here's the PRP. The way we do this, there's not just, you know, NCAR and SDSC, U UCSD. Uh, Irvine has a big group, Hawaii, uh, University of Chicago, uh, um, uh, University of California, Irvine, University of Illinois at Chicago, USC, uh, NCAR, uh, San Diego State. And this is a subgrid just for the climate scientist within the PRP that we are measuring this. So what we can do is to expand the PRP. We do it by scientific teams. So basically we find teams that are on these campuses and then we start um, trying to get their network worked out. Because remember, it's got to get to your disk where your computer is, either the computer in your, in your laboratory, your local cluster, um, whatever. Now this is a little bit different, but um, I was sort of fascinated how this worked because I had Hans Werner Braun, who was the person who developed the high performance uh, wireless research and education network uh, 17 years ago. I worked with uh, for a number of years at SDSC and Frank Vernon is now uh, leading this. NSF funded this for, I don't know, 12 years, something like that, to build out probably the most detailed um, high-speed wireless uh, network uh, over a large region in the United States. This is the Salton Sea, so that's all of San Diego and Imperial County. Uh, and you'll notice that the, um, like the yellow points are all first responders. So this is for the fire. We work with all of the um, fire, um, rural fire departments and so forth. But for your point of view, the purple points, uh, which are all the seismic stations all over the, the southern San Andreas Fault uh, that Frank Vernon runs, all that seismic data is brought back across these up to 155 megabits per second. And these are basically up on the top of mountains where those, tele those you know, towers are. We put dishes up there and then those, we, we have line of sight, um, so anywhere from tens of megabits up to hundreds of megabits. Um, 
a second, and then down into the valleys and the East County and so forth, where there's no commercial, you know, cellular internet or anything. And again, this is a major collaboration across multiple places, including us, uh, Scripps. And Scripps in particular is focused on, um, has a responsibility for the seismic imaging and um, all of these little triangles, if you can see them uh, here. Um, let's see where we are, there. All those, tr those little purple triangles are seismic stations. And down here you can see there's a very high, uh, in the circle, a high uh, density across one of the major faults and so forth. And these are solar powered, uh, and so it's a big, big operation. And the kind of thing that is important is that um, we have wildfires, <laughs> as you may know, here in California, and uh, they're getting worse. And it used to be there were just a few months a year, now they're year-round. And uh, here was one uh, from just, uh, what was it, uh, two years ago, um, three years ago? Uh, just one observation point from the HP Wren. Each of these are cameras up on the mountaintops, so we have 360-degree cameras that are taking pictures every few seconds and sending them back. And you can see here we had multiple fires simultaneously going on, um, and then we could track the fires, and that's really about the only way to do it. So what has that got to do with a PRP? Well, until now, all of this was on the wireless. And then the servers that were keeping all that data were just, say, at SDSU, San Diego State University, or they were here at UCSD, and, and, but all of those are connected by the optical backbone of Scenic, the California Research and Education Network. And so what we realized is that for disaster relief, for data redundancy, all of that sort of thing, we can just use the optical network between the servers to be handling that. But more importantly, if you look up here at this little graph, this is uh, over, uh, over time, those giant spikes are the number of people hitting <laughs> the server wanting to see the camera image because there's a wildfire on. And, the, and, and this is a huge increase. Well, you, you could either pile up lots of servers to handle that burst that only comes once in a you know, few times a year, or you can use the PRP to link between groups of servers because chances are if there's a fire here in San Diego, there's not also one at the same time up at Irvine, although that's not always the case during the Santa Anas. Um, and so the idea then is that we now have a coupled optical backplane, wireless high-speed uh, uh, network, and we are uh, at, let's see, this is not quite June, is it? Tomorrow uh, is June. Uh, at the end of June, uh, we are, uh, the Cal IT2 Advisory Board is meeting at Irvine and we're dedicating the antenna for the first time on the top of the building at Irvine. And now all of Orange County is going to be extended to this. And we, from the same mountaintop, we can see uh, Riverside. Riverside is a very long county, goes all the way to the border uh, of California. And so those two counties can be brought in. But because we have scenic now, getting their network engineers to have to figure out how to do the wireless stuff, all of a sudden, any of the 10 UC campuses, the three private campuses, the 30 some odd Cal State campuses, all the community colleges and 9,000 K through 12, all of which are connected by Scenic, can in principle from their schools send these wireless networks out and set up a, a wildfire warning session or environmental sensing or earthquakes or anything else that would be environmental sensed. Um, now one of the most amazing things I've watched happen, I don't know how many of you have been involved with NSF's funding of the Ocean uh, Observatory Initiative and the um, putting of cable um, observatories on the ocean floor. I've been involved for 15 years or so. Um, but this is now off the coast of Washington and Oregon uh, out to the Juan de Fuca uh, plate, the small plate that uh, has a spreading center there uh, and an active uh, volcanism, the axial um, volcano. Uh, and these are using, what they do is they just use standard um, submarine cables uh, that have all the optical fibers, but then they also have 10,000 volts 
of electricity you can send. So this is now two and a half kilometers down on the ocean f surface, uh, ocean bottom, and they can have rovers that come up and recharge and then head out and do things. They can have all kinds of instruments, uh, about 140 so far. And, and so these are persistent, unlike the ships that go out and have to come back. These are sitting there 24 seven. Um, and that is all done over course optical fiber, right? So it turns out that the northernmost university in the Pacific Research Platform is the University of Washington. And uh, we're actually talking with the two Oregon universities about becoming members soon. Um, and so we can, in principle, just have the flow from those instruments come down here to, say, the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, where there's a lot of people who would like to be studying those instruments. Um, and the great thing about it is that John Delaney is going to be coming. He's the PI, uh, was the PI for many years of this, is going to be spending a couple of months here at SIO this summer. All of these are earth science uh, uh, areas that uh, these instruments are capable of looking at. And I'll just show you one in particular. This is uh, uh, one of the uh, sea mounts, um, and uh, the, uh, that's about 15 feet high. And that is uh, 40 HD high definition frames that are taken from a fixed point and put together to watch this thing grow and crumble. Uh, and then uh, every three hours, there's a 14 minute live HD feed from this. And so what John and I are gonna do this summer is actually link this into the PRP and then make it so that anyone on the PRP can uh, see this and you, know, you can use it either for education, research, and as I say, there's 140 instruments. So, um, so those are my four examples of, of, of how the earth sciences are already beginning to use it. I just wanna say a few words about um, coming back to this notion of, of machine learning. Uh, Horace Simon, who I've worked with for 30 years in supercomputing, is the deputy director for research at uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab. And, and he's been saying for years that, you know, you think about using high performance computing. Right now that means using uh, multi-core, shared memory multi-core chips like Intel or AMD and a GPU. Those are both von Neumann architectures, it turns out. One is the GPU is a SIMD, a single instruction multiple data. Um, and, uh, but what he's saying is that non-von Neumann architectures are gonna be needed because with this massive increase in data, we've got to begin to look at pattern recognition and discovery, not just arithmetic and, and logic. Um, and for instance, IBM came out with the True North chip, uh, which is the largest chip they've ever fabbed. Um, that is a neural uh, spiking network uh, chip, very non-von Neumann. And uh, so to develop this, we've uh, created a pattern recognition lab in this building uh, for machine learning uh, uh, as well as on the non-von Neumann processors. And here we are back almost two years ago getting the first of those IBM chips. The way that machine learning works is typically very compute intensive and, and, and so the GPUs are the graphic processing units or the things that are, are the coin of the realm that are, that are used. Uh, but there's not that many GPUs to get at um, uh, on a lot of the campuses. And what we found in particular, if you're doing machine learning, you don't need the full 64-bit NVIDIA, Tesla, you know, gold-plated, high-priced uh, uh, GPUs, actually the gaming GPUs, which they ship 50 or 60 million a year of from NVIDIA, uh, are just fine. And in fact, that's 32-bit single precision. In fact, 16-bit actually is probably enough because the noise in the data is such that you don't need that higher accuracy. And right now, if you're having to pay for it, if you go to AWS, Amazon Web Services to get use of GPUs, you're gonna pay for gold-plated things you don't need if you're doing machine learning. Now, if you're doing, you know, hydrodynamics, uh, turbulence, whatever, you need double precision, 64 bits, by all means, go use those. But this growing wave of machine learning is not. So what we've done is put together a consortium on the PRP of campuses where we've got about 30 um, machine learning computer science investigators, and those are the universities, and we're hoping to get a grant that will uh, supply 320 of these uh, in a distributed cloud of uh, GPUs, so you use yours locally and then you can surge out to the others as, as needed. And here at UC San Diego, 
Uh, we uh, are, have just put together a 48 GPU cluster for uh, the Open Science Grid at SDSU, SDSC. Um, we've got another 48 that we're looking at to get for students. And then we're building a new three-dimensional cave. I'm sorry I can't take you into the uh, old cave because we, we tore it down. Um, it was the best in the world, but you know, it was getting on uh, five years. So we're building a whole new one called the Sun Cave. That'll have 70 GPUs. Uh, and uh, this allows you to do hundreds of thousands of uh, core hours uh, for projects. So those of you who are doing big data and want to do machine learning, I'd love to talk to you while you're here because we're pulling together a set of applications people that are interested in making use of this as well as the people who are developing the machine learning algorithms. So I've only, I'm almost done. Uh, we're um, sold out now for our first workshop in the PRP um, uh, that is taking uh, people from all over the country and in fact from the world to look at what would it take to scale up this regional network. And this is by far the biggest one in the United States, the PRP, by a lot. Um, but it's 20, 25 universities. There are a couple hundred <laughs> research universities in the United States. So it's a huge effort to imagine how you would um, you know, scale this up. Internet 2 obviously is very interested. They asked me to give the closing keynote to the uh, Internet 2 Global Summit um, and where we announced this. There are 120 people that are coming to this workshop. And so this is really to begin to understand both from the application scientist point of view, from the campus point of view, from the networking point of view, what is it going to take? What is it going to take to actually build the plans to make this a national one? But we're not stopping there. Um, this thing, PRP, was born global. And we have already partners in Korea, Japan, uh, Australia, Netherlands. And in fact, the Korean one is now up and going on, on um, the Mad Dash uh, diagram that John was showing you. And it's uh, capable of, it's over five gigabits a second. Now, one of the, for the technical folks, Whenever you have TCP IP and it's got to go over high bandwidth over long distances, that's where TCP IP has always had its problems in terms of dropping, falling back and so forth. No problem at all using these Fiona's uh, across the uh, ocean. And that means essentially worldwide there's, this is going to work as far as uh, technically um, being extended. So I'm going to just stop there. This is, uh, there's of course, a lot of different folks went into funding this and making it possible, but I think we have time for a few questions. <laughs>